Well, thank you so much for taking the time to join. It's been an amazing event, and thanks for staying uh, all the way through. I hope you enjoyed it. I want to talk about something that we do every single day, and many times over, we all make decisions. Raise your hand if you had to make a decision already today. Yeah, all of us, right? And the most difficult was first thing in the morning to get out of the bed. That's probably the most important decision, the hardest we all make every single day to roll off the bed. Some days are easy, others are not. But we make these decisions all the time. And when we make these decisions, we think about these as often, do I want to do it or not? Do I like it or not? Yes or no? Well, we tend to really think about these things in our mind quite often, but when it comes to these decisions, it's not always that simple to think about these decisions. And I want to spend this uh, time talking about various things we do in software development and also in life as well. But I want to start out by first saying that decisions are really hard a lot of times. It's not easy, partly because we carry our emotions with it. We have a, a little bit of a saying in how we decide as an individual, as a team. Uh, is it things that we want to do collectively or individually? So a lot of those things complicate what we do. But as it turns out, when it comes to decisions, one of the things that makes it really hard also is not just what we are deciding, but where we are in deciding it. Our environments matter a lot. And we can't take a particular problem and say, well, that was easy for me to decide, but not for others, and why? because they might be in a completely different environment, completely different setting. There could be things that really make it hard for them to even think about it. But I would first of all say, before we even think about making decisions, one thing that makes a huge difference is the will to make the decision. It actually helps to sit in a meeting and ask the question, are we willing to change? That's a very important question to really ask. A lot of times we don't ask that question, and we get into a struggle and we kind of wonder, why is it so hard to make a decision? Why is it hard to change? Well, because we haven't checked with people, are you even willing to change? Sometimes if people are committed to doing in a certain way, and no matter what argument you will make, they won't change, why bother wasting the time being in the meeting? So the first thing to ask is, do we have the will to change? Now, sometimes it's easy to assume that certain things cannot be changed. And this happened to me about roughly two years ago, maybe a year and a half ago, and I tweeted this, and I tweeted this out of really uh, awe, if you will, and that is, those who compare building construction to software development understand neither. And a lot of times in software field, we compare to building construction. And we say, oh, in building construction, you know, this happens and that happens. In software development, is different. And uh, I remember one experience years ago. I was sitting in an airplane, and uh, next to me was a gentleman. We started having a little conversation, and I asked him, what do you do for a living? And he said, I'm an architect. And I kind of paused for a minute, and I said, are you an architect or are you a real architect? And, and he kind of looked at me and said, well, if you can define me what a real architect is, maybe I can answer that question. And I said, well, I work in the field of software development. He said, you don't need to, you don't need to say anything more. And he said, I'm a real architect. <laughs> <laughs> and this was a good conversation to have to understand another field which I'm not very familiar with. But my most recent aha moment really came when my wife and I decided to build our you know, her house during the pandemic. And we hired an architect. And, and I want to emphasize this was a brilliant architect. We, we really, really appreciate what he has done for us. Brilliant person. But when he designed this particular house for us, he said there's going to be three steps to get into the house. And we wanted to orient the house in a certain way. We wanted to make sure that it you know, is in a certain place in the land. So there were constraints we posed on him. And when he finished his architecting, and he showed us the architecture, he had everything really done well. To the extent, a lot of times I asked him the question, are you a mind reader? How did you know this is what I want? And he's like, well, I kind of figured this is what you're going after. But one thing that bothered me was, 
that there were three steps to get into the house, into the house, either through the front door or through the garage. And I went to the architect and said, hey, I got a question for you. Can you get rid of those steps to go into the house? You know, uh, I've got parents who live with me in the summer, uh, mom and dad, not easy for them to climb the stairs and go into the house. Would be nice if they can just walk in. I'm not gonna stay young all the time. There's gonna be a time when I might need a wheelchair. Uh, and the architect said, no, 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 you cannot remove those steps because based on the elevation, based on this, based on that, you need to have it, all right? Okay, can you put a ramp in the garage so we can take a wheelchair in? Oh, you can't put a, a, a you know, ramp in the garage because you need a certain slope and there's a city code and et cetera, et cetera. You cannot do it. So I'm like, okay, fine. So we had a lengthy discussion about it. All right, we'll live with these steps. And then a couple of months goes by, and uh, at 6.30 in the morning, literally, my wife gets a call from this fine gentleman uh, uh, who is uh, David, David Hammer, and David says uh, to my wife, hey, I'm here, we're digging the hole to you know, build, build the foundation, so I got trucks over here, and we are just about to dig the hole. And my wife says, well, thanks for letting us know, but Venkat and I are busy today, we cannot come over there. Uh, hopefully you can you know, get started, we'll come and take a look at it later on. And this was about an hour and a half, two hours from where we lived. And he said, no, 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 the reason I'm calling you is, do you want a zero entry? And she said, what is a zero entry? Well, you can just walk into the house with no steps at all. And she's like, well, thanks for asking, Dave, but Venkat had a lengthy discussion with the architect, and they found out that they cannot do it. And he said, no, no, that's all right, but I'm not asking you what you did with the architect. I'm asking you, I've got guys to dig the hole here. Do you want a zero entry? Like the programmers telling, don't worry about what the architect said, right? <laughs> and she's like, really, seriously, you can do it? Like, no promise, but that's what you want. And she's like, yeah, of course, that's what exactly Venkat has been asking. He wants a zero entry. And then he comes back at three in the afternoon and says, here's a bunch of papers for you to review, and you need to take really good care to review these, and once you approve, we are ready to move forward. And we are looking through and going through every single thing, and all the elevations, everything changed. And I called him and said, how do you do this? He said, well, I've got the guy who's digging the hole, and he said, here's how you can actually do it. So we called the architect and said how we can actually do it, and he agreed. So we changed the entire architecture right there. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, this is constructing building, right, not software. <laughs> and then I asked him, but Dave, why do, you, why do you do this? Because this was not the only time he did this. He would call me in the middle of construction and say, hey, I know you wanted this, but this is what the architecture says, but I would rather do what you want. Just want to make sure, is that what you want? I'm like, yeah, of course. And he would change things. We've been living in that house for one year. Love the place. And I went to Dave and I said, can I ask you a question? Why do you do this? Because anytime I told anyone I'm constructing a, constructing a custom house, immediately their reply is, I'm really sorry to hear that. Because they've been screwed over so many times. And I said, why do you do this, Dave? And Dave gave me an answer that made me literally cry. He said, I built a house once, but it's for you to live there for a long time. And I go to my programmers and, oh, I wrote the code already. <laughs> the will to change is the very first step. And that's what Dave really showed me. From a field we think is not as agile as it could be. That's the front door of the house now where we can literally walk in with no steps to really climb across, and it is because the person had the will to change. So the very first thing I think we should really ask is, are we willing to consider options? Are we willing to consider different ideas, or are we gonna get stuck on what we decided? Whatever that framework or the library that we decided to use. But of course, you know, building constructions, but there are things that are more critical than that as you would accept, right? For example, like these decisions to make. <laughs> let's, let's understand this. Raise your hand, how many of us use the over-orientation? Just look around, fair enough. How many of you use the under-orientation? A few of us. It's okay, you're among friends, that's okay. Now, 
overwhelmingly we had over orientation. So I was curious, huh, which one should we choose? And I started, of course, doing everything that anybody else would do, start Googling for it. And I found this absolutely scary evidence, so to say. And here's what I read. The correct way to hang the toilet paper, according to science, <laughs> hanging in the wrong way can result in absenteeism, workers' compensation, and even business lawsuits. Who wants that? Those people who raise their hand for underhanging, you better watch out. <laughs> and then I said, but wait a minute, it cannot be that deterministic, because if that is the case, you can ask the people who are hanging it under, why would you do it? And then I started strangely noticing how these things are being hung. And I looked at the airplane, and guess what I noticed in the airplanes? They use under orientation. I looked at lounges, they use under-orientation. And I was like, why do those, these people use under-orientation? And then I started researching. This is important science now, isn't it? <laughs> and I started researching and I found out that if you have a very small kid in the house, you don't want the paper roll to be rolling across your house, or even worse than kids. There are kids that will never grow up, they're called pets. If you have a pet in the house, guess what's going to happen? The pet is dragging the paper all over your house, turns out underhanging is a lot better. So there are times when underhanging is better, there are times when over-orientation is better, but which one is correct? Neither one is correct. And there are some people who choose wisely to use the under-orientation, and the rest of us misguided, me included, use the over-orientation because of whatever convenience we think about. But there is no clear choice here as, as you know, we can learn from this experience. But very few things in life are binary in nature. It's not this or that, and we need to really rethink about it. For example, let's talk about ego. If I ask you, is it good to have ego? You're like, oh, no, no, no. You should be an egoless person, right? We all are told. So we want, we don't, ego is bad. But let's think about it for a minute. If I have zero ego, what's going to happen? I'm going to have low confidence. No self-confidence. Hey, what do you think? I don't know. What should we do? Well, whatever you decide. I'm not going to help you and make any decision because I have no ego. Slow confidence, low self-confidence is not a good thing to, is, is not a good idea. But what about the quite opposite, overconfidence? Even to the level of being narcissistic, that's really bad also. And we know a few people like that, especially in the politics. We don't want that, obviously. So what we want is, we want ego. But ego, kind of like cholesterol, you need to have the right amount to be able to live healthy. I mean, you don't want anyone with no cholesterol, that being dead. But you want reasonable cholesterol. So almost anything is really, really finding that balance. But here's another thing we can think about. You know, how are you? In fact, I encourage you, go ahead. Turn to the left and, and look at the person to your left and ask, how are you? Go ahead and ask. Let's try it. Go ahead and ask. How are you? Yeah, you heard a response, right? What did you hear? I hope you did not hear terrible, right? I hope you didn't hear that, right? Nobody said, oh, I feel terrible. If you did, you are the friend, get them the help they need, right? Did you hear fantastic, awesome? That's a proof you're sitting next to an American. <laughs> because that's what we say. You come to me and say, how are you doing? Great. Why would I say, okay. We want energy, right? We're doing awesome. So the best way you know you're sitting next to an American is just asking, how are you? Great, fantastic. We are going to the moon. I was teaching a course in Sweden a few months ago, and, and good people, but they decided to have some you know, fun with me. As I entered the room, they said, how are you? I said, fantastic. And they all kind of laughed. And I said, you seem to be laughing. And, and they said, yeah, we just wanted to kind of get a feel for how are you. I said, well, I guess you don't respond that way, do you? And they said, no, we don't. 
And I asked, how do you respond as a Swedish? They said, they're okay. Not too bad, not too great. Right there in the middle. What a beautiful sentiment, isn't it? I love that. But don't expect me to say that, right? I'm fantastic. But the point really is, again, there is this balance we need to think about. And that Swedish balance is something I really admire. A bit of a humility, a humbleness. At the same time, hey, we are going to be doing great. Should I be an optimist or should I be a pessimist? Some of us are optimists. We know who they are. Some of us are pessimistic. I like to call them as being more realistic in general. But I then came across the story of a pessimist and an optimist who walked into a bar. And I was like curious, what happens next? So the bartender, of course, asked the question, how are things? And the pessimist chimed in, saying, it cannot get any worse. And the optimist corrected. And so, <laughs> Should we be a pessimist or should we be an optimist, right, is the question. Again, there is no right answer to this. If somebody is overly optimistic, we are blind to reality. We may drive the team to a disaster. If somebody is entirely pessimistic, we're not moving anywhere. We want a realistic situation. Be optimistic, but not overly optimistic. Be pessimistic, but not overly pessimistic. Again, a balance. Uh, should I say yes? Or should I say no? That's a question we need to ask ourselves oftentimes. And I was telling one day that the more yes you say, the less you will deliver. And you know, the people who say yes all the time are the most dangerous people. Because can you do it? Yes. Can you do that? Yes. Can you do this? Yes. How come nothing got delivered? Well, I don't have time for any of those because I overcommitted. I was mentioning this to my son who started working last year, and, and he was telling me, Dad, uh, in my company, they have several divisions, several departments, and they ask me if I can do. I said, yes, I can do that. Yes, I can do this. I keep saying yes to everybody. And I said, son, if you keep saying yes to everybody, I mean, what does that mean? And he said, Dad, that's great because that's how I get opportunity. And I said, you know what? That makes actually sense. Because when you, you're fresh out of college, you're in your first job, and people are asking you to do stuff, and you want to say yes, that opens up door. Is he wrong? He's absolutely correct. But then I say no about 70% of the time these days. When conferences call me and say, can you come and speak? Like, sorry, I cannot, because I cannot be everywhere. Hey, can you work on this project? So I cannot. We got, got clients already I'm working with. Can you teach this course? So I cannot, because I'm already committed to teaching a course on those weeks. So I say about no 70% of the time. But which one is right? So I realized neither one is right. A novice, the one who doesn't have much experience, in a certain area, don't assume novice is a 19-year-old something or a 20-year-old something. I am a novice in a lot of things I don't know. You could be a great programmer. Maybe you're a novice as an architect. Maybe you're a great architect, but you're a novice as a director of development. So we are all experts in something and novices in so many things at the same time. But if you're a novice, you want to gain experience. What you want is to show, I've done that, so I can do this for you. And you want those opportunities, that's what a novice wants. But what do you want as an expert? And as an expert, you want to succeed. As an expert, you want to gain reputation and retain it. You cannot have reputation if you don't deliver on your results for the things you accepted. So I, it turns out, should I say yes? Should I say no? And the answer is, say yes eagerly when you're a novice at something. But begin to say no, but nicely. Your boss comes to you and says, I've got an idea. No. <laughs> and you're not saying no to the boss. And that's one of the things we should keep in mind. You know, sometimes we feel like, oh my gosh, I'm saying no to my boss. I'm saying no to my you know, colleagues. I'm saying no to my tech leader. I'm saying no to my product owner. No, you're not saying no to the person. You're saying no to the task. 
that distinction is very important to have in our mind. Because when you say no, you are saying, I want to complete what I said yes to words. And then that is our responsibility. So as you gain experience, be willing to say no politely for the task, and actually people begin to respect. Because when you say yes, you mean business. When you say no, you really are not taking on things you cannot deliver. Don't take what you cannot deliver. Don't promise what you cannot deliver is a good thing to consider. So it turns out to be a curve, if you will. So you want to say yes quite often in the beginning, but as you gain experience, maybe you want to politely start saying no. So you can actually be more successful in delivering what you committed to, and that's really a good thing to do. Again, there is no yes and no here. There are things I would say yes to, and there are things I would say no to, but there's no binary decision here. We need to think about it a little bit more clearly. But living is an act of evaluating trade-offs. So this is fundamentally what it comes down to for what we do in our profession and in our lives. It's evaluating these trade-offs. For example, you can very rarely decide on things in isolation. So rather than thinking about decisions as a switch that you can turn on and turn off, what if we start thinking about decisions as interconnected dials. And they are not just dials, but interconnected dials. If I were to change this dial here, unfortunately, it affects yet another dial that I cannot really control. So they are very interconnected dials. So you are not at this point asking the question, can I turn this on or can I turn this off? Your question is, what can I set this to a reasonable level? Let's think of an example for a minute. This literally is my backyard. And this was my backyard back in December. And this was a very cold winter for us in Colorado. And we were in the house during this uh, winter storm. And this seemed to last forever. And we looked at the weather. The temperature literally was minus 35 degrees. That's how I felt. It was literally minus 35 degrees. I was mentioning this to a friend of mine. He was very curious and he asked, is it Celsius or Fahrenheit? When it's minus 35, does it matter? <laughs> because it doesn't matter. Celsius or Fahrenheit, it feels like hell. I was curious and I looked up and I found that minus 40 is the best number because it's the same in Fahrenheit and Celsius. But it was cold. And of course, we had children home, which is nice to have them. Away, being away, they come home. And what's, what do the children do when they come home? They live in dorms. They live in their own place. Things are warm. They're in mom and dad's house. Ooh, it's chilly, isn't it? Like, yeah, it is chilly. It's called winter, son. Could we raise up the temperature a little bit, please? And guess what happens? If I raise the temperature, the kid is very comfortable. My wallet, not as much, <laughs> because I'm spending more on energy. If I lower the temperature, my wallet is thankful, right? It says, cool, keep going, Venkat. So now I tell my kid, no problem, we can increase the temperature. By the way, here's the bill if you're willing to pay part of it. And they say, Mom, where are my clothes, by the way? And if you come to me in my house in winter, you'll see Venkat with six layers of clothing because it's very comfortable, both on my wallet and my body. So now, what's a good temperature to set the house in? Well, about a 60 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know what it is in civilized metrics that people use these days. I live in the country where we're still using barbaric units. 65 degree Fahrenheit, I guess is like what, 15, 16 degrees Celsius. I keep the temperature around that, maybe 18 degrees Celsius. It's comfortable when you have six layers of clothing, you don't spend too much money on energy. So all of a sudden, hey, should it be warm or cool, really is not a binary decision. I want to now think about it in a certain different way. So here is the range of temperature. This is too warm, this is too darn cold, it's going to be unhealthy. 
But now I have a range of temperature. Similarly, I have a range of money I want to spend. So now question is, what can I pick in between here so that the money is in between here? Because if I go over here, that's really uncomfortable. If I go under here, it's not comfortable, but financially it may be better. So now I am trying to find a range that meets both the goals. How can I spend enough or reasonable, at the same time keep it warm enough, maybe with a few extra layers of clothing? So now we are making decisions. If I increase the temperature, the economics hurt. If I save on the money, my body hurts. What's the range that is reasonable with, between them is what I'm trying to pick. But this goes to yet another thing to think about. Back in time, Toyota was spending the time building their cars, and once they finished building their cars, they would send the cars out into, into the world for people to use, and they would come back with the repairs. And they found out that their manufacturing cost was you know, somewhat in that range, but their maintenance cost was very high. And so they were question is, how do we reduce our maintenance cost? And Toyota went through this. This is Toyota of the 1970s I'm talking about. And they took the time and they figured out if they take a little bit more time in an effort in manufacturing, increasing the quality of what they did, they found that the maintenance cost was coming down. So when you look at this, when we, we, this is one of the things I want to really think about a lot of times, is the local optimization versus global optimization. We as humans collectively are a lot focused on today, not because of our own fault. I got a bug to fix. I got to finish this report. I got to prepare, prepare for this presentation. I've got to get this report out. I got to talk to my boss because he or she is waiting on this to be available tomorrow. We focus on the short term a lot. Hey, what's my project budget? How can I bring it under my project's budget? I want to show that we finished what we are doing under this budget. But we totally lose sight of the global optimization. What's my health 10 years from now? What's my health 20 years from now? What's my saving 10 years from now? What's my health 10 years from now? What is my relationship? 10 years from now. What is it 20 years from now? That is a long term. So a lot of times, the long term one day becomes a short term, and we say, oops, I didn't prepare for it. What is the point of winning in the short term and failing in the long term? So here is Toyota's principles, and the very first thing says, base your management decision on the long term philosophy even at the expense of short-term financial goals. That takes determination. How many of us are willing to say, hey, I want to, I'm not, I'm not saying don't fix your bug today, but we put more importance on things than they really are. I had a client of mine email me and said, hey, I want you to send me a proposal for this course. We are interested in doing this course. And I replied immediately to the client and I said, uh, I'm at a client's site, but let me work on it tonight and I will get it to you. And the manager responded saying, if you get it to me anytime this week, I will not look at it. This is not my priority this week. Here is when I'm going to look at it. If you send it to me before, then that's enough. And I'm like, wow, why was I trying to get it too soon? Because it's mentally, mind our self-induced urgency to things. That bug maybe can wait till tomorrow. It was there until you knew it. That report can wait till tomorrow maybe. But you going to work out this morning is as important, if not more important, because that's your life in the long term, your health in the long term. And so when we start putting long term before the short term, we tend to think and process information very differently. But most of it, I will guarantee you, is self-induced. We put pressure in our own mind. Oh my gosh, I got to fix this now. I got to do it in half the time. Why? Because we said it to ourselves, not because others really need it. But then the matter of communication, how we put priorities into what we do. So survive in the short term, succeed in the long term. 
I don't want to lose sight of my long-term success because I want to focus on my short-term because that would, in the end, be a colossal failure. So I don't want to succeed in the short term. I want to survive in the short term. I want to just get by the days so I can succeed in the long term. That's where my eyes are. That's what my goal really is. And, and, and that's act of prioritizing what we do as well. So be sustainable in what you do. Living, I mentioned, is an art of evaluating the trade-offs. So it's not about which do you pick, it's which do you select in balance so that you can get multiple things working within the range that's reasonable. And programming is how we make a living. So everyone in this room is involved with software development one way or the other. That's what we do for a living. And it, as it turns out, that's basically exactly where we are. And let's think about evolution of software for a minute. Way back in time, we did waterfall development. What is wrong with waterfall development? I don't want to just say, oh my gosh, you shouldn't do waterfall. But what is wrong with it? Well, in waterfall development, and that's where I started my career. I've been programming for about 35 years now, and my first projects were waterfall. That's what we started with. So we start with the requirements analysis. We spend weeks on end listening to requirements. And, and I loved those days, by the way, because they would say, you're going to go into this requirements meeting, three weeks. But I loved it. They gave you lunch. <laughs> they gave you dinner because the you know, meetings went longer. You had good coffee, donuts. At the end of three weeks, my boss would come to me and say, how was it? I would say, it was great. <laughs> and he would say, what did you like? I think the donuts were really good. I would say, no, 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 I was talking to the requirements. Oh, I'm sorry, I don't remember most of it now. It was three weeks of things pouring on me. Once we finished the requirements phase, we went to this analysis phase. It was amazing. We analyzed the heck out of it. When we finished it, we did design, and we created this beautiful documentation. And sometimes they would say, can you improve it? We'll add some colors to it. Then we wrote the code. And you know, when you write the code, there's something beautiful happens, right? When you write the code, you compile it. And sometimes it compiles, <laughs> sometimes it doesn't. And when you finish compiling, what do you do? You run it. And the minute you run it, you see it. And the minute you see it, you complain about it. And now you say, no, 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 that's not what we wanted. You need to change it. Software exhibits the observer effect. But isn't that good? The problem is, we started with requirements, analysis, design, and here we are in implementing. We haven't gotten to testing yet. And you look at the schedule and say, whoa, that's the end of the timeline. And you look at this and say, and they're saying, but that's not what we wanted. You're like, what do you mean that's not what you wanted? We went through analysis, we went through design, but none of that gave us the feedback we needed. So the minute you run the code, it's not what you want. But that moment in time, when you see where you are to where you need to be, that moment is called panic. That's what hits you hard in waterfall, is you look at this and say, oh my gosh, there's not enough time. And what do you do when you are in panic? You become irrational. When you're irrational, what do you do? You do stupid things. And what happens when you do stupid things? You're in more in panic. This becomes a vicious cycle, and the only way we get out of it is we change jobs. <laughs> and what happens? You enter into something that's already in panic mode, right? And this eats up everything. Oh, don't worry about this exercise, and that can wait until the next project. And we work long hours, we screw our health, and we are in the cycle. We, we jeopardize everything, including our health and everything else around us. That didn't work really well. Well, now, of course, the good news is we are doing agile development. What does that mean? No design. How does this work? Don't worry about it. We are agile. What's the schedule? Don't worry about it. We are agile. What? Don't worry about it. We are agile. How could that possibly work? That's not being agile. That's being in denial. I call this the fragile development, not agile development. 
I go to companies and they say, when could we want you to know we are agile? I say, I'm so glad we got that out of the way. Now let's talk about what you actually do. And then I find out they do waterfall, but they call it agile because that feels so good. But the question is, is this working for us? So yeah, no design doesn't help us. So planned design doesn't help us. Emergent design completely messes up with what we do. We need to strike a balance. What if we do a just enough design? Maybe we can do an evolutionary design, but that requires effort, that requires governance. One of the most important thing in agile development is adaptive planning. One of, the, one of the things really important is adaptive planning. Planning is so important, we continuously evaluate our plans. If we don't do adaptive planning, why bother even doing it? So again, there's a balance we need to strike. I started my career programming in languages like C++. That's what I spent most of my time writing production software, C++. Then I picked up Java and C Sharp and languages like that. And all of a sudden I realized I've been programming only in statically typed languages. And then somebody said, you should really try dynamic type language. They had good intention, but the very first dynamic type language I tried was JavaScript. Heck, that's it, I was done. No way in the world I'm gonna do that nonsense, right? And I went back to programming in C++ and Java and C Sharp, and then one of my friends said, you should really do dynamically typed languages. I'm like, are you serious? And then I started embracing the idea of writing automated tests and test-driven development. And when I started doing test-driven development, I realized, whoa, compilers are great because they give you feedback. But that's not the only type of feedback you can have. Your automated tests can give you feedback too. And the minute I started embracing more automated testing, is when I started programming more in dynamic type languages. I program in Ruby and Python and Erlang and JavaScript as well. But the point is, now I don't fear those languages. I don't let them control me because I have control over what I do. That feedback loop can make a difference. Then I realized, wait, there is benefits to both of these. Design by contract, can help me with fewer runtime errors. Not no runtime error, fewer runtime errors. It can help me to compile the code and check for validity. I can look for conformance in the code. Those are good things. But dynamic type languages give me design by capability. That gives me the ability to write more extensible code. I can be very flexible. I can make it more evolutionary. I can do meta programming a lot better in these languages. And all of a sudden, I've got a set of tools on my hand that I could never experience in a language that is fully statically typed. Language like Groovy and Ruby and Python just opens up opportunities that I could never experience programming in this particular way of systems. And then you start beginning to think about it and say, wait a minute, which one should I choose? I have friends who would only choose one or the other, and they're adamant. This is right, this is wrong. But I don't feel that way. There are times when this is better, but there are times when that is better. But having the choice makes me better. And so, it's kind of like saying, hey, you want to build a car which is really, really robust, right? Absolutely. Then build the entire car with steel. Hey, what about the tires? Steel. <laughs> well, yeah, that would be silly, right? So a good car, has enough spring in it. No, I'm not talking the spring framework, the spring itself, right? But why do we put those things? Because we want malleability. We want things to really take those shock, otherwise things break, we break. And so there are parts of an enterprise system that requires that thoroughness and robustness and conformance, and there are parts that don't. And this goes back to Ola Bene's language pyramid. He talks about what if we envision an enterprise system where you have a stable layer, you have a dynamic layer, and you have a domain-specific DSL layer. Well, a, a complex system can benefit from multiple layers, just like a complex machinery is going to have different kinds of parts to provide different services in it. 
And in that case, he talks about maybe Scala or Java can make up the layer in the bottom. Maybe language like Clojure or Ruby or JavaScript or you know, Groovy or Python can make the middle tier. And maybe the DSL layer can be your domain-specific languages you can create for your application. Now we are thinking about application very differently, saying, hey, which layers can benefit from which languages? We make decisions based on that, rather than saying everything has to be just one language or one way of thinking, one way of doing, and, and we tend to really think about a system differently. But similarly, we talk about design principles. This is quite scary. I, I, don't get me wrong, I love good ideas, I love good principles. But recently I was looking at a piece of code for a client of mine, and I asked the developers, why have you created this design this way? Because I was noticing there was a lot of complexity in the code. And their answer was, they said, why? We wanted to use solid principles. I'm like, well, wait, if you're using solid principle, if your design is really complex, what's the point of using that principle? Well, they've gone overboard. Their goal now was to use a principle rather than asking the question, what are we trying to deliver as a, as a result as a, of our effort? We cannot lose sight of that. So a lot of these things can be used in a way we end up with very poor solutions if we only focus on this one thing I have to apply over and over. For example, let's just take things a little bit about things we have been told things we've been taught about, reuse. How many of us like reuse? A lot of us, right? Absolutely. Because we've been told reuse is good. We have to reuse what we create. Create reusable code, create reusable function, create reusable class, create reusable libraries and frameworks. We're after it. How many of us think we should increase coupling? Raise your hand if you think we should increase coupling. One person wants to increase coupling. How many of us think we should decrease coupling? Most of us think we should decrease coupling. Now, what we just did is we contradicted ourselves, unfortunately, right? Because what happens is, if you increase reuse, if you decrease code duplication, by nature, you are increasing coupling at the same time. And that becomes a bit of a trade-off. For example, if you put coupling on one hand, Reuse and reuse on the other hand. If you have low coupling, you have low reuse, and you have low, uh, more duplication, because you don't want to depend on it. How do you not depend on something? Make a copy. You're not depending on that anymore, but you're duplicating. Oh, I don't want duplication, I want reuse. Great, create a shared library for that. What do we do? We increase coupling. Now, gosh, which one is right? Neither one is right. The question to ask is, what are you building? Why are you building it? What's your end goal? Imagine this for a minute. We take the time and we build all these infrastructures. We focus on software principles. Reuse is important. Keep it uh, dry. Don't duplicate. So what did we do? We create this reusable library. And we put all these code to depend on it. And we are celebrating this as programmers, right? This is awesome. We've done a wonderful job writing this code. The poor product owner comes to you and says, excuse me, can I ask you to make this change? Oh, you want that change? No problem. When can I have it? Um, eight months. Eight months? Why do you need so much time? Dude, you don't understand software development. <laughs> you simply don't. In software, we do things in a certain way. Your change request will go to this particular team. They evaluate it. And then it trickles down to all these other teams. By the time they are done, the customers don't need that anymore. They don't even remember asking that feature from you. What's the point? We lose sight of why we are here by focusing on how we should do things, so religiously, if you will. I'll give you an example of this. There is a company, I cannot give their name, that I was consulting with, a very large insurance company in the US. And I was sitting down, working on a product, and I looked at this developer and I asked a question. And I really wish he, I, he said no. But the question I asked him was, here's a class, can I look at the database table for this class? And I wish he said no. 
He said, sure. And he opens the schema and shows it to me. And that class, that one class I was looking at in this application, I'm looking at the table in the database. It had 800 columns in that table. And I said, it's got 800 columns. He said, uh-huh. <laughs> and I said, one table with 800 columns. He said, no. Every table has hundreds of columns in it. And he shows me all the tables and every one of them with hundreds and hundreds of columns in it. And I looked at him and said, you have a schema with many tables with hundreds of columns in it. He had no emotions. <laughs> he just said, uh-huh. And I said, why? He said, because they need to use it. And I said, who uses all this? He said, everybody. Their enterprise has thousands of applications, and all the applications, guess what they do? They put their hand into the schema. Now think about this for a minute. That massive mother of all schemas is sitting there, and everybody is pointing at it. Now maybe you decided to go to an interview with this company, and they are, you're having a good time talking to them, and around lunchtime they say, why don't we go to the cafeteria? We've got a great cafeteria. Well, let's go have lunch. So you're down having lunch with them. Everybody is having a good time. People talking politics, talking about next JavaScript framework. People are talking about a lot of bad things. <laughs> and then you notice, way back in the room, all the way over there, away from everybody else, there's one person facing the wall and eating with nobody nearby. You said, who, who, who is that? And they say, we don't talk about this person. You're like, really? What happened? And they say, well, three weeks ago, he tried to change the schema. <laughs> and he's on timeout for two months. <laughs> Bad things can happen, right? So when you walk into this company, what do they tell you? They give you one thing to remind you. And what is that? They tell you, don't screw up. That's what they tell you. Don't screw up. Because for them, the most important problem is called stability. Don't change anything. It's business as usual. If you want to change a schema, send a change request. Whom do I send it to? You send it to the schema team. And they will evaluate it. Hey, I want to make a change to the architecture. They had an architecture committee, by the way. This architecture committee will review every single change and they will approve it in the next about 18 months. Architecture committee is where innovation went to die in this company. How can you work in such an organization and produce result? Because your goal is to maintain stability. Code stability took precedence to business agility. Nothing changes. You want a change? Request for it. Eventually, two years later, it'll show up, and you don't even remember why you asked for it. So if your goal is stability and reuse and avoiding duplication, beautiful, you got it. But the business, who cares, right? We are great. We are having a fun time developing software. But if your goal is business agility, how can I respond to the business's need? Now we have to rethink about it. I'm not suggesting that with vengeance, we should go duplicate code, no. Same thing with encapsulation. In this company, the database schema completely spoiled any reasonable effort to encapsulate. It totally fails the open close principle, if you talk about principles. Because you change the schema, you mess with every single product. There was no encapsulation. So, we're not saying duplicate with vengeance. That's not your goal. But the question is, reduce duplication, but prioritize encapsulation so you can provide business agility. This is one of the driving forces behind doing microservices if we really are doing microservices the right way for the right reasons, that is. And so we need to reassess some of these decisions. So is reuse good? Yeah. 
Is duplication, avoiding duplication good? Yeah. Is reducing coupling good? Yeah. But you cannot have all of that. And these encapsulation good. Oh my gosh, that's one of the most important aspects we've been drilled down in object-oriented programming. But we lose sight of all of that because suddenly we realize, oh my gosh, what about encapsulation? Oops, we didn't realize we violated it completely. And that becomes a problem as well. So evaluate trade-offs. It's never about this versus that. It's a question of asking, how do I manage, how do I compromise so I can get multiple goals into this in a reasonable level? I'm a huge fan of functional style of programming. But that doesn't mean that's the only way to do things. I like imperative style of programming as well. When I write code in imperative style, what are some of the benefits I get out of imperative style of programming? The first benefit I get is, a lot of us are very familiar with it. You can find almost any developer who can write code in imperative style. There is, there is strength to it. You can do exception handling all you want in imperative style. You can throw exceptions, you can catch them anywhere you want to, and you can have multiple nested levels of exception handling. No problem, it's meant for that. You can receive really raw performance in your code as well. Why am I a big fan of functional style of programming? It reduces accidental complexity. The code is easier to maintain, it's easier to understand, it's easier to parallelize. But you're not probably gonna get that raw performance out of the code. I cannot tell you how many times I get emails every week from somebody saying, hey, here's a piece of code in functional style, but how do I make it run really fast? Wrong question to ask. So on one hand, you have maintainability. On the other hand, you have performance. If I give you the maximum performance possible, but your code is not maintainable at all. Guess what's gonna happen? It's super fast, but when you have to make a change, nobody can change it. We need eight months to change it. And the business is scratching their head. Why do you need eight months to change? Because we made it so good, <laughs> we cannot change it. But if I only care about maintainability and nothing else, the software is doggone slow, nobody wants to use it. So we gotta strike a balance. And any time somebody asks me this question, what about speed, what about performance, how can I make it fast? Same thing with scalability and performance. If you increase performance, you may reduce your scale. If you make it more scalable, you may reduce your performance because you gotta make more network calls. It's a balance we have to strike. So the first thing I recommend is, don't ask, is the code fast? Terrible question, terrible question. Because this is naive. When people email me and say, here's an imperative style code, I wrote it in functional style code, how do you make this code fast? Am I like, why? Why do you want to make this code fast? Because saying that I want to make the code really fast is like saying, I want to buy the fastest car in the world. And I always ask the person, where are you going to drive it? They say, why in the middle of Bangalore? or Boston for that matter, or London. I'm like, dude, get a bicycle. <laughs> That's gonna get you faster around town if speed is important to you. So you cannot really expect fastness of the code. The most important question you wanna ask is, ask is the speed adequate? That is the question we wanna always ask, is the speed adequate? If my code is adequate in performance, then I want to see if it's maintainable as well. Because if I make it overly fast, but I lose on understandability, readability, uh, maintainability, then I lost the game in the long run. But if it's fast enough for what my customers need, then I win by making it even maintainable as well. I had a developer uh, who was extremely passionate about Python. We were writing Java code. We let him in the room. He was sitting in this corner writing Python code. But one day, he comes back and sits down with a thud, and I can see that he was really angry. And he loves Python. I looked at him and said, having a rough day at work today, aren't we? He looked at me and said, Venkat, I just came from this other room. They're writing horrible Python code. My blood is boiling. I cannot see people writing bad code like that in Python. I said, yeah, so that happens sometimes. And he said, you know, they're writing bad code, and I asked them why, 
And they said, because they have to write it that way to get performance out of Python code. What do you think? I said, well, I won't answer that question, but does that code have performance? He said, that's a problem, it doesn't. Now you got two problems. You got a code that cannot be understood and it doesn't perform as well. So the end result of worrying about performance often is the worry and not the performance. This is what we mostly deal with. We worry about it so much in the end, we're left with the worry but not the performance. So we need to be very realistic about what we're trying to do. And it's important to say, those who sacrifice quality to get performance end up getting neither. And, and so we have to be realistic. Is it adequate for what we want to achieve is the question we want to ask, not can it be fast, you know, fastest code. So where performance is truly important, write test for that first. This is something I emphasize quite a bit. If performance is really important, write a test first. I had a client who spent three weeks of development of two developers to improve performance on a piece of code. And at the end of the time, they were like, awesome folks, the code is beautiful, it's performing really well. And guess what they did? They totally forgot about it. Fast forward two years, literally, and somebody comes to them and says, oops, that code is not performing well. Now they're looking into it. And the two developers are like, we vaguely remember working on this two years ago. Well, why don't you look at it? And they look at it and say, it's exactly the code we worked on two years ago. But people have been changing it for two years, and the performance is gone. So what do you do? Fix it. They spend three more weeks again fixing the code. What was wrong? They never put a test that verified the code performs adequately. Had they taken the time to write the test before they improved the performance two years earlier, guess what's going to happen? A year into it, somebody makes a change. And the test unit test pass, but the performance test fails. They're like, oops, we got to go back and take a look at it again because it's not adequate. So if performance is really important, write a test for it. And people will say, my gosh, it's hard. Well, if it's hard, why are you doing it then? Because you don't even understand. Why would we want to do what we don't understand? If you cannot really describe it, and yet we want to modify code to solve it somehow. So this makes us ask better questions. What are the requirements? What are the needs? Designing and architecting is really evaluating trade-off. So the decisions are no longer binary. They really are trade-offs we have to evaluate, compromises we have to take. We got to ask the question, how can I get this in this range without losing on this other thing? How can I balance it out? And fundamentally, designing and architecting is evaluating trade-off. So identify, first of all, what is really essential for your applications. Don't try to throw together things based on emotion or you know, hearsay. Hey, what are the things that are really, really important for the application from the customers, from the usage point of view? Once you can define what's essential, then prioritize what is really important and then start focusing on those things that are important to bring in within those ranges that are possible and evaluate the trade-offs for the things that are really important. So don't make binary decisions because decisions are not binary and it's a range in which we are trying to select. And it turns out decision-making is an optimization problem. And optimization problems often don't have a single solution. We try to pick from a collection of solutions, all of which are reasonable, and we want to choose what is better of the options we have available. And decision-making is an act of considering and evaluating and accepting compromises as well. And we should be willing to accept that this may not be the best we want, but it's good enough compared to other things we want to accomplish as well. So the most important thing when it comes to documenting so when we are all focused on developing applications, what can we document? And I would say the most important thing in document is the why. Why did you make this decision? That is the information you don't want to lose as time goes on. A year from now, you're looking at a solution, hey, we should do this. Let's go back and see why we chose that. Because if we don't remember why, we can repeat those problems. 
So the most important thing to document is the why. And the most sensible answer you can give, we all know this, it depends. Hope that was useful. Thank you.